Uh, it's now time for us to read from God's Word. Um, our first reading is taken from uh, the Old Testament part of the Bible, um, and it comes from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 8. So that's Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 8. Okay. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and, and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be, to, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Okay. Um, and the second reading comes from Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 to 29. So that's Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 to 29. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean, the law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it, is no longer, or it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. And it was put in place through angels by an, inter sorry, by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law has been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Okay. 
Thanks, Karuba. Welcome if you're new or visiting here. Uh, my name is David. I'm the pastor here, and it's great to have you here with us. Welcome if you're watching from live stream as well. We're looking at the very first Christian document that was ever written to help us understand the very first gospel that was preached. So let's pray that we would uh, get understanding from God's word today. Heavenly Father, we pray as we see this morning your wonderful plan uh, to drive us to Christ and save us in, from all of Scripture today, that you would help us to understand this and help me as I explain these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I get it. I really do get it. The Bible is a hard book to read. There's so many different stories. And, to, and if you're new to Christ, the, the Bible can feel like a bit of a maze. You know, you can, there's a story over here and there's a story over here and there's a dead end over here and there's a, there's a hill over here and a valley over here and you kind of wonder, how is it all connected together? What's it all about? Um, this is a great Sunday to be here because we're going to understand the whole story of the Bible today. Wonderful. Uh, the passage that we're looking at today is Galatians chapter 3. It's not an easy pa passage. Did you have some difficulties as that was being read out today? It's quite tricky. But what Paul does here is he reviews the whole story of the Bible. What he does is he takes 2,000 years of history and he shows us how the story of the Bible is all connected. And you've got to understand the background to what Paul is saying here. See, Paul, he kept saying to this church in Galatia, he said to them, when you become a Christian, here's the order that things happen in. First, you put your trust in Christ. Second, you get accepted by God. And third, then you do good works. But in Galatia, some false teachers had entered the church and they were saying to that church, ah, Paul got the order wrong. Here is the true order. First you put your trust in Christ, then you do good works, and then you get accepted by God. And they wanted to take uh, the Galatians back to the law of Moses. And what Paul says is he says something very smart. He says, you don't know the story of the Bible. You need to not go back to Moses. You need to go back 430 years earlier. You need to go back to Abraham. And what Abraham will show you is that the order has always been, first you put, you have trust, second you get accepted by God, and third you do good works. That's the order. And it's always been that way. You need to know the story of the Bible. And so what Paul does is across the whole landscape of the scriptures, he pulls out three mountains to show us. He pulls out Abraham, and then Moses, and then finally Jesus, who's like the Mount Everest of all the others. And what you need is you need these three people to understand the story of the Bible, and you need them to understand something about God and something about yourself. Here's what we're going to hear today about these three people. See, Abraham is going to teach us that a promise is a promise, verses 15 to 18. Moses is going to teach us why we need the promise, verses 19 to 25. And then Jesus Christ, he's going to show us the getting of the promise, verses 26 to 29. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, all teach us different things. So first, Abraham teaches us that a promise is a promise. You've heard about Abraham. He was the um, old man from modern-day Iraq whom God made a covenant with. And Paul says, let me tell you how covenants work. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. It says, brothers and sisters... Let me take an example from everyday life, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. See, in the ancient world, people made promises to each other, just like we make promises. We would sign a contract. In those days, they, they 
cut a covenant. That was the terminology. It was like making a pact, right? And you made it official by a ceremony. And the ceremony involved taking some animals and cutting them in half and laying the halves out along a pathway and each person making the promise would walk in between the slaughtered cut animals and they would walk up and down be between the halves. And you know what they were saying? They were saying, if I don't keep my end of the bargain, may, what, may what's happened to these animals happen to me. That's what they were saying. You couldn't break a, a contract like that. You couldn't change it. A promise is a promise. And when God made this promise to Abraham, he said to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to get some animals and cut them in half and lay them out. You can read about in Genesis 15, and he did. And what happened next was quite amazing. It was God who passed between the animals. It wasn't Abraham. It was God signified by the fire and the torch. And it, you, know, you know what God was saying to Abraham? My promise to you, it doesn't depend on you. It depends on me. And if I don't keep my end of the bargain, may what's happened to these animals happen to me. That's what God was promising. He's, the promise that God made to Abraham has nothing to do with Abraham. It has everything to do with God. All Abraham had to do is to believe. There were no strings attached but what was the promise that God was giving to Abraham? Look at verse 16. The, scripture, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. The promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. Now, that's from Genesis chapter 17. When we come to Genesis 17, here's the promise that's made to Abraham. It says, The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants, that's the word seed, your seed after you. I will be their God. See, it's a promise for Abraham and his seed. And in this case, the seed is Israel. God is promising Israel an inheritance, the land, Canaan. He's promising Israel farmland and countryside and backyards, right? It's a beautiful promise. But see, Paul says, God wasn't just speaking to Israel. There's, there's an immediate fulfillment, but there's an ultimate fulfillment. He's talking about someone else because Paul says the promise was given to Abraham and to his seed, singular. Okay, It was given to the true seed, the true Israelite. That's what Paul's saying. You know what he's saying? You know who he's talking about? Jesus Christ. He's the true seed of Abraham. See, God didn't just have farmland and backyards in mind. You know what he had in mind? He had in mind a new heaven and a new earth. He had in mind an inheritance. He had in mind people getting the Holy Spirit, people having their lives washed clean. That's what he had in mind. It's not seeds, it's seed. It's bigger than Israel. It's cosmic. It's ultimate. And the whole point that Paul is making here is you only get this promise by faith by trusting. See, even the law of Moses couldn't stop this promise. Uh, look at verse 17. He says, what I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. See, the Jew some Jews were coming to the Galatians and saying, you can only be blessed if you obey the law. But Paul says, no, you've got to go back to Abraham. A promise is a promise. And the law, which came later, that doesn't cancel the promise that God made to Abraham. Here's why. Verse 18, for if it, the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. 
See, when God promised to Abraham, he was saying, Abraham, I will, I will, I will, I will. It was all God. God's not going to break that. 430 years later, when he gave the law to Israel, and he said to Israel, you will, you will, you will. It's very different, isn't it? It was all about Israel. And they couldn't do it. It it didn't work. And it's not like God woke up one day and said, you know, I think I'm going to change the way I do things around here. I've started off with promises, and I'm I'm now going to, you know, go to this law-keeping uh, way of doing things. Okay, we're not operating under promises anymore. Now we're operating under the law. See, Paul's saying God, the way God operates, hasn't changed. God always operates under grace promises. He doesn't operate under law promises. We're so used to law promises, aren't we? You know what a law promise is? If you work really hard and if you study your heart out, you'll pass the course. You'll pass your HSC. You'll you'll complete your course if you study really hard. That's a law promise. You know what a grace promise is? It's when a teacher says to you, it doesn't matter how hard or how little you study, I'm going to pass you anyway. That's a grace promise. Any teachers here ever done that? I mean, that's a new way of doing things. You have, Nalini? It's a new way of doing things, isn't it? And here's what Paul is saying. God operates by grace promises, not law promises. And if you're a Christian here this morning... You've got to know that the way God operates with you is exactly the same way that he operated with Abraham. He hasn't changed. See, God says to you, I will bless you, I will save you, I'll give you a new heavens and a new earth, I'll wash you clean, I'll give you my spirit. Just trust me. It's not dependent upon you keeping my laws, it's not dependent upon you obeying me. It depends upon me being faithful to you. You've got to trust that I'm keeping my word. A promise is a promise. Now, how much do you have to believe for the promise to work? How much faith do you need to have in order to be saved? Here's a picture of a bridge. Okay, this bridge has been dubbed the world's most dangerous bridge. It's, it's a real bridge that exists in northern Pakistan. It's, um, it's called the Horit Lake Bridge, and uh, I wouldn't want to cross that bridge at all. But here's another bridge. Ah, uh, uh, isn't that nice? The Sydney Harbour Bridge. Now, my question to you is, would you, which bridge, if, if you had a choice between having strong faith in this bridge or weak faith in that bridge... Which one would you pick? Okay, strong faith in that bridge or weak faith in that bridge? You know, you know what you're thinking. You're thinking, don't be crazy, David. You know, it's not about my faith. It's about the bridge. Do you see the point? It's the same with God. It's not a, when you trust in God, it's not about how little or big your faith is. It's about who you're trusting in. It's the object of your faith, which is important. And uh, you just need to have, with either of these bridges, you just need to have enough faith to walk across them. What matters is not the size of your faith, it's what your faith is in. And that's why what Paul does is he lifts up Abraham as the model of faith. And he says, you've got to know the story of the Bible. God operates by promises. Look at Abraham. He just believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You need to know Abraham. You need to know this guy. You need to know it's not about your obedience to the law. It's about God keeping his promises to an old Middle Eastern man. Abraham teaches us that a promise is a promise. But we come to Moses. And Moses teaches us why we need the promise. See, you need to know that you need this promise That's what Moses teaches us. Now, Moses isn't actually mentioned here, but he's the one who gave the law to Israel. 430 years after Abraham, he gave the law 
uh, God gave Moses the law who gave it to the people of Israel. Now, why did he give the law? Verse 19 says, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions. Okay, transgressions. Why did God give the law to Israel? It's because of transgressions, which means, the word transgressions means breaking the law. Okay, what a transgression is, it's when you fail to keep the law. There's a law that's written and you don't keep it, right? In August last year, only 30% of people were wearing masks on trains, okay? Only 30%. And in January of this year, uh, it became a law to wear a mask on public transport. See, before it used to be common courtesy and you'd think, oh, I need to wear a mask. And not everyone did it. And people would look at others who weren't wearing masks and think, you selfish person or whatever, right? But it, on the 2nd of January, it became a law. You had to do it. When you don't wear a mask on the train, there's a penalty involved. And when you are on the train and you're not wearing a mask, you know what you're saying to the state government? You're saying to them, I'm up for a fight, okay? I'm on, we're on different sides now. That's what you're saying, right? Now, that's exactly what the law of God does. What the law of God does is it highlights that you're up for a fight with God. What the law does is it tells you what sin actually is. It defines sin. It says this, whenever you steal, whenever you don't honour your parents, whenever you lie, whenever you cheat, it's, you're breaking God's law. Uh, and it, you've got it in writing that you're in conflict against God whenever you do these things. And there's a penalty involved. And the penalty is death. In fact, even the way the law is given... It shows that there's a huge gap between you and God. Now, verse 19 is a bit tricky, but have a look at it. It says, The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Now, here's what Paul's saying. When, when God gave the law to his people, he didn't deal with them directly. Not like he dealt with Abraham, right? What he did was God spoke to angels who spoke to Moses, who passed the law on to Israel. There were mediators involved, right? There was a chain. Because what the law does is it just highlights that there's a gap between you and God. So why did God give the law? Why, what is it good for? Verse 21 says, Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. The law could never give you life. You could never keep the law and think, oh, you beauty, I've done it. I'm accepted by God. No, you know what the law does? It deflates you. And it makes you realise, oh man, I can't do it. And what the law does is it makes you thirsty for a saviour. And that's why what Paul does next is he draws two pictures of the law. The first picture is a picture of a prison. Verse 22 says, The scripture locked up everything under the control of sin. See, God gave the law to make us prisoners. Uh, you know, as soon as God gives you a law, you think, Oh, I can never keep that all the time. In fact, the law there just makes me want to disobey it. Uh, I, I can never, I can't even keep my own standards, let alone God's standards. See, what the law does is it traps you and it makes you feel like you're in prison. And the other image in verse 23 is the prison of a, a guardian. Verse 23, before the coming of this faith, we were in custody under the law, locked up under the faith that was to come, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we may be justified by faith. Now, in the ancient world, the rich kids had guardians. And the guardian was the person who would uh, educate them, but also discipline them and teach them some manners, 
right? It's, it's kind of like a tough prison guard. You ever seen those prison movies where there's, you know, the, the tough prison guard who is covered from head to shoulders with muscles and tattoos and you, and you take one look at the guy and you're, you're quaking in your, in your boots, right? And, you, you know, you just look at the prison guard the wrong way and you'll be beaten. You'll be thrown into the slammer. You'll be, you, you, just, you just cross the line and you'll be punished. That's what the law is like. The law never lets up. The, the law never gives you a second chance. The law beats you for every error that you make punished for every wrong look that you give. That's the law. And that's why what the law does is it makes you long for a saviour. As you're there in your prison cell and you're looking out and you're thinking, I can't keep the weight of this law, I can't keep its demands, and you look out and you see your saviour who's there with his open arms ready to accept you. That's what the law does. See, the law drives you into the arms of Jesus Christ. See, Moses teaches us to look outside the prison cell that we're in, to look and see the promise that God is offering to us, the promise of a saviour. I love how John Stott puts it in his commentary. He puts it like this. He says, not until the law was, has bruised and smitten us will we admit our need of the gospel to bind up our wounds. Not until the law has arrested and imprisoned us will we pine for Christ to set us free. Not until the law has condemned and killed us will we call upon Christ for justification and life. Not until the law has driven us to despair of ourselves will we ever believe in Jesus. Not until the law has humbled us even to hell will we turn to the gospel to raise us to heaven. Is that you this morning? Do you feel like you're in despair of your own life? Do you feel as though you can't even keep up with your own standards, let alone God's standards? Oh, praise God, there's a saviour. There's someone who can release you from the prison cell that you're in. Someone who can take away the weight of guilt that you're feeling over whatever it is that you've done, the shame that you feel, that if people knew about, you would just feel as though the the room would open up and swallow you. There's a saviour for you. You know, one of the problems we face in the church today is we don't like talking about sin, do we? We, Oh, it's a dirty word, sin. When people come to church, we've got to make them feel good about themselves. We've got to make them, you know, feel energised. We don't want to make people feel guilty. Ah, but that's, do you see? That's the job of the law. What the law does is it doesn't, it doesn't excuse sin. It doesn't soft pedal sin. The, the law won't let us do that. Of course, we can't stay there. We need to hear that there is a saviour who is there for us. See, what the law does is it shows us the need for the promise. It shows us our need for grace. That's what Moses teaches us. Moses teaches us that God had to make things worse before they could get better to show us we need a saviour. And so finally, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ shows us the getting of what God has promised. Look at how this passage ends in verse 29. It says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Remember how we said the true seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ? Now what we're told is if you belong to Christ, the true seed, then you also are Abraham's seed. Jesus Christ, the true seed, the one who perfectly kept the Lord, Jesus Christ, the true inheritor of the promises. And if you align yourself to him, if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you know what happens? You get the promises that were promised to Jesus. You become an heir and you get the inheritance. You get salvation. You get the new heavens and the new earth. You are washed clean. And that's why Paul says something shocking in verse 26. It's shocking, but we're so familiar with it that we're not shocked by it. Look at verse 26. 
So in Christ Jesus, you are all children. Now the word children there is not really there, it's the word sons. Your, your sons. In Jesus Christ, you are all sons of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. See, when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what happens? You become a son. Now, ladies, it's not sexist language, all right? Because when in the ancient world, a son was the one who had all the privileges. A son was the one who got the inheritance from the parents. The firstborn son got double the inheritance. The, son had, the sons had property rights. The sons had privileges in the ancient world. And what we're being told here is shocking, that no matter who you are, if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a son of God. You trust in the Son of God, you yourself become a son of God. Now, you may not be genetically related to Abraham, but you become related to him if you have the same faith as he has. That's how you get related to Abraham. And so what happens is everybody, no matter who you are, everybody approaches God in exactly the same way. Verse uh, 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I've got to say, just as an aside, this is one of the verses in the Bible that has been severely misunderstood. All right? People want to say today that what this verse means is that there's absolutely no differences between men and women. There's no racial differences. Um, you know, uh, you can treat a woman as, as if she's a man. That's not what this verse is teaching. Um, what this verse is saying is that even though the differences are still there, the differences don't get in the way of our fellowship. You are all one in Christ. In Christ, no matter who you are, we come to Christ in exactly the same way. You don't get a special privilege if you're slave or if you're free, if you're Jew or you're Gentile. Jews don't get special privileges over the Gentiles. Men don't get special privileges over the... We all come exactly the same way. It doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter what race you're from. It doesn't matter whether you live in a prison or a palace. It doesn't matter whether you're young or whether you're old, men or women. It doesn't matter whether you're from Sri Lanka or Australia or South Sudan or Iran or India or America. It doesn't matter. You come in exactly the same way. We all need a saviour. We all need to be clothed in Christ. Look at verse 27 again. It says, You were baptised into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of being clothed. Put on Christ. It's a wonderful picture of being naked, but you need someone to come and clothe you. And what the Lord Jesus Christ is offering is he's offering to clothe you. Do you remember how the story of the Bible started? It started with us feeling naked. Well, we were naked and we felt ashamed. We needed someone to clothe us. And that's the story of the Bible, that God has made promises to this man called Abraham to clothe us in Christ. And Moses comes along and he teaches us that we need to be clothed. We're, we're, with the law, we're shameful and we're guilty. And then Jesus Christ comes along and he gives us the clothing so that when God looks at us, there's no shame. We're clothed in Christ. See, with Jesus, you don't need to dress up. He dresses you up. You have nothing to offer. No works to give. No goodness of your own. No status that he will look at you and say, look how important you are. There's none of that. No, you know what it is? It's nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Naked come to you for dress. Helpless look to you for grace. That's the story of the Bible. Let me pray for us.
Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the promise that you've given us. You've shown us through Abraham that you are promising to bless your seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we would cling to the seed, cling to the Lord Jesus Christ and come to him to receive the beauty of the promises that you've offered to us in him. Oh, Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. In his great name we pray. Amen.